Welcome. I'm Dr. Craig Weiner. And hello, I'm Suzanne Fagel. And we are the co-creators of Tapping Out of Trauma. And we're here today offering another free teleclass as part of Tapping Out of Trauma's ongoing educational series on working safely and effectively with trauma. Yes, and we have something really, really special for you today. I mean, they're always special, but this one's really special, is we have the honor of interviewing Mark Willen. And Mark is the author of a fascinating new book that we highly recommend, and it's called It Didn't Start With You, How Inherited Family Trauma Shapes Who We Are and How to End the Cycle. And it's published by, uh, by Viking uh, just this year. It's brand new. Mark is a leading expert on inherited family trauma. Uh, He's the director of the Family Constellation Institute in San Francisco. He's trained thousands of individuals with chronic pain, anxiety, depression, self-injury. He's a sought-after speaker right now, especially around the world, and on specifically how past traumatic experiences of our families can affect us today. He's taught at the University of Pittsburgh, the Western Psychiatric Institute, the California Institute of Integral Studies. His articles have been in Psychology Today and Psych Central. His website, for more information, so you know up front, is www.markwillin.com, and that's spelled www.mark, M-A-R-K, W-O-L-Y-N-N.com. And in his book, Mark describes how the experiences of our parents, grandparents, and even great-grandparents actually leave an imprinted legacy on our DNA. He describes his clinical experiences in dealing with people with seemingly unsolvable issues by unraveling and the the keys to unraveling events that occurred in our ancestors. So without any further ado, Suzanne, why don't you go ahead and start? And and Mark, welcome to the call. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. So Mark, let's start off by asking, how can trauma be passed on from a parent to a child? So when a trauma happens, it, it changes us. Literally, it causes a chemical change in our DNA. It doesn't affect the sequence, but it changes how our genes function, sometimes for generations. Technically, uh, after a trauma, a chemical tag, a chemical signal will attach to our DNA, and this can silence or activate certain genes. And the way the genes are affected Um, changes how we act or how we feel. For example, we can become reactive to situations that are similar to an original trauma and then learn to deal with it better uh, by the way our genes will express. Ultimately, it's adaptive, it's helpful, um, uh, but not always the case when the trauma was a generation or two ago and we're still having reaction from this. And we're learning that these gene changes can be transmitted to our children. So our children are not always born with a clean hard drive the way we would like or imagine. To to use a computer analogy, there's an operating system already in place that contains the fallout from our traumas, our parents' traumas, sometimes even our grandparents' traumas. And our kids can be born with fears, just as we can be born with fears and feelings and phobias that don't always belong to us. Okay. When, when, so, so I love this. So I, I've heard you use the phrase um, basically a biological trauma. So in other words, what I'm hearing you say is that our, our, those before us have been through traumatic events just like we have, but somehow it's encoded um, and somehow it becomes part of bio, our, our biology. Are you starting to see any uh, scientific research that's actually helping to support this idea? Scientists have long suspected something like this was happening. I mean, you feel it, you know it. I mean, people know it. But it wasn't until about 10 years ago that the science began to roll in. There is a very well-known neuroscientist out of Mount Sinai Medical named Rachel Yehuda. She discovered that the children of Holocaust survivors shared the same trauma symptoms with, with their parents specifically the low levels of cortisol, which is the stress hormone that gets us back to normal after a stressful event. She finds a similar pattern in the children that are born to pregnant mothers that are at or near the World Trade Center when it's attacked during 9-11. 
Um, in fact, just last year, she finds um, that survivors and their children share the exact same gene changes, the exact same gene changes, in the exact same region of the same gene. Technically, it's a gene that helps regulate stress, um, the FKBP5 gene. And this, this research suggests, more than suggests, that these traumas are heritable. In fact, Rachel Yehuda says that you and I are three times more likely to have symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder if one of our parents had PTSD. And then as a result, we're likely to struggle with anxiety or depression. And, and there's, yeah, um, there's, I mean, she's, she's doing the work with humans. There's a ton of studies that are showing up with mice. The reason they can um, use mice and rats in place of humans is mice and rats share 99% of a similar genetic makeup. So out of 30,000 genes that we have, mice have 29,700 approximately that are similar. And they... Um, have done some extraordinary tests with shocking mice after they smell a certain smell to cause them to fear this smell and then see that the mice were fearing this smell for three generations, even, on, even though the, only the first generation had the electric shock. Um, the pups in the second generation and the third generation became jittery just when the smell is introduced. So they have the fear response without the trauma itself. And that's, that's the amazing part. We're walking around with a fear response that we didn't experience the trauma from. Mm-hmm. So how did you get started on this work, and what's your personal experience with inherited family trauma? Uh, okay, two questions. Let me do the first one first. How I got started. Um, 20-some years ago, I was working with cases that I just could not explain in the context of a client's life experience. So I'm finding people that carry deep elements of trauma, but as I was finding out, the traumas weren't experienced with them directly. I'll I'll give you an example. I worked with this cutter, a cutter who cut so deeply that she would almost bleed to death, which is unusual in the experience of cutting. It's um, her particular, the the particular way she cut, she would hit um, very deep vessels, veins, arteries, and bleed and have to be rushed to the hospital um, for blood loss. And that was strange. That was symptom number one that that made me think, okay, this is what I've been, I was working with a lot of self-injurers, but this was different. And so I asked her, what do you think about right before you, as you're holding that razor blade and you're about to cut? And she said, I deserve to die? And here I am looking at a 24-year-old woman, and, and literally her life has just begun. And I say to her, what have you done? Did you accidentally harm someone, take a life, break up with someone, and they committed so you know, she said, nothing like that. And so I looked in her childhood and with her parents, and she had lovely parents. In fact, they were the ones rushing her to the hospital, and no one had any excuse for what was uh, understanding. No one could understand what was happening. Lovely relationship with her mom. Lovely relationship with her dad. Her attachment with her mom was full and strong and loving. And then I asked the question without really knowing what to do. This was 20-some years ago. Tell me about the rest of your family members. And boom, she dropped the bomb. She told me about her grandmother, who was an alcoholic, who was driving the car drunk. And Grandpa was in the passenger seat. And she hit a pole. And Grandpa went through the windshield. And here's the significant information. Grandpa got lacerated, cut on the glass, and bled bled out before the ambulance could arrive. He died. And now it made sense. Who was the person who felt felt that that she didn't deserve to live? Wasn't my client. It was the grandmother. 
the grandmother felt that she didn't deserve to live for taking the life of her beloved. And here we could see that both experiences, the bleeding and the feeling like she deserved to die, she was expressing, but it was not her trauma. And how do we know we hit the right trauma? Because she stopped cutting once we worked together. Uh, you ask me another question. How I got started <laughs> was similarly, uh, per my personal experience, um, was a trauma. Uh, about 25 years ago, I lost the vision in one of my eyes, and I was diagnosed with a chronic form of retinopathy, and the doctors couldn't cure it. And because of the way it was progressing, the doctors told me that I was likely going to lose the vision. I had the chronic form of a very leaky retinopathy, a lot of scar tissue. I was told to expect that it was going to affect the other eye, too. I was going to be legally blind, they told me. And I was terrified. And I was desperate to find help. And I went on a search for healing. And this search led me... Uh, ha halfway around the globe, literally as far east as I could go to, to, to the Far East, to Indonesia, where I learned from several wise teachers who taught me some pretty fundamental principles that we don't learn here, one of which was the importance of healing my relationship with my parents. But before I could do that, I had to heal what stood in the way which was inherited family trauma. I just didn't know it at the time. But specifically, it was the anxiety that I had inherited from all my grandparents who were all orphaned in some way. Three of them lost their mothers when they were babies, and the fourth lost her father when she was one. So ultimately, she loses her mom's attention as the mom is grieving. And I learned later that this anxiety, this was the real cause of my vision loss. And like my parents, I'd inherited this feeling of being broken from a mother's love. Oh, my goodness. I remember um, five or six years old, a small boy. I'm panicked whenever my mom leaves the house. Of course, just like my grandparents, right? But I don't know it. I'd run into her room crying into her scarves and her nightgowns, thinking I would never see her again that her smell, that would be the only thing I had left. And this is true. My grandparents never saw their mothers again. And the smell was probably all they had left. Forty years ago, I shared this with my mom, and she told me the exact same thing she did when her mother left the house. She would cry into her clothes. And then when my sister was reading the book, she said, you did that too? When mom would leave the house, I did the same thing. Yeah. And after you know, working through these principles that I learned, healing my relationship, with my parents, my sight came back. My sight came back. And afterwards, I felt compelled to share what I had learned and ultimately developed a method for healing the effects of inherited family trauma. It's a very so, powerful testimony. It is. And so I have, I have two follow-up questions. You, you mentioned the, the lineage. So the first part of the question is, how many generations back does this go? Mm, good and question. You know, research is suggesting that it goes back about three generations. So uh, there's a, another researcher named Isabel Monsui at the Brain Research Institute at the University of Zurich. And in 2014, she traumatizes male mice by separating them from their mothers. And then afterwards, these mice are depressed. Well, you know, depression-like symptoms, as best as you can tell in mice. Um, but the strange thing is the pups in the second and third generation have the same depression, the same trauma symptoms, despite never having experienced the separation from the mothers, the trauma themselves. So technically, for those in your audience that are um, science geeks, you know, they, they find abnormally high numbers of microRNAs. And microRNAs, it's a genetic material that also regulates gene expression. They find this in the blood and the brain. So the symptoms are found in three generations. But here's the interesting part. The mice in the third generation, third generation, although they have the same trauma symptoms as their fathers and grandfathers, they use male mice here, they did not 
have the elevated numbers of the microRNAs in their brain and their blood. And so the researchers could speculate, aha, the behavioral effects of tra traumas, this can express for three generations, but perhaps not beyond that. Does that make sense? It does. And yeah. so the second half of that question is the idea that, well, we let's say a parent is depressed and we're around environmentally, a depressed parent or grandparent, and we have a tendency towards that. So I just want you to speak to, is the traumatic sequelae because we're consciously exposed to the things that our parent and grandparent, does it have to be, or can it come across generations without us having no idea it even happened? Oh, yeah. In fact, what we don't know about can have the greatest effect. In fact, it's better if we know. In fact, the more we know, the more our parents talk about these things, the more there's healing, resolution, calm, restorative calm in the family from these traumas, the less likely these traumas um, tend to transfer down into subsequent generations. What I see is that when traumas remain unresolved, when the healing is incomplete, or, or the people involved in the traumas are rejected or excluded, we're going to see aspects of these original traumas repeating in later generations. So unconsciously, people will repeat a pattern or they'll share a similar unhappiness. Often when they reach a certain age or they experience a similar circumstance or a similar event. I, I once worked with this guy um, who, he loved his dad, but the, the death of his dad was so great, he never fully grieved it. He was 13 years old. In fact, there were three boys in the family, and they all adored their father. And because he died, they could never really heal this all the way because the grief was so great. So when my client was 48, he was 13 when his dad died, but when he was 48, he got tinnitus. And his other brother, when he was 48, he had a heart attack. And when his other brother was 48, he left his wife and kids. They each found a way to limit their life experience unconsciously, as if they were saying, hey, Dad, if you couldn't live, then we won't live fully. So this can happen also not at, just at ages. But also when we reach a certain milestone, you know, these are signs of inherited family trauma. We experience a similar event to what our grandparents or parents expressed. Um, uh, mom lost her great love. We lose our great love. Dad was jilted by his great love. The boy loses his. Dad fails. The son fails. Or a similar experience occurs, and we develop trauma symptoms or a phobia or a terrible fear that lives in our trauma language. So we're walking around, and this is what I, I love. I love to hear people's trauma language. We're walking around with language like, I'll go crazy. I'll lose everything. I'll hurt somebody. And that's not our language, but we carry it. Thank you. Well, so thank you for those examples. It sounds like there's a number of different ways that you can tell if somebody's suffering from inherited trauma, either by their behavior or by their fears or phobias or their um, uh, strong emotion. Um, yeah, so it's like there's an ancestral alarm clock that somehow starts ringing inside us. When, when we reach a certain age, we, we have the fear. We didn't have it prior, or we have this sudden onset of anxiety or a symptom that strikes suddenly. Um, for example, one of the signs is when, you know, we'll get married, or we'll have a child, or we'll be rejected by a partner, or, or we'll even move to a new place. I once worked with this woman who attempted suicide twice, both times. It was six months after she moved to, into a new home. 
And it wasn't until we kind of looked at the details of the suicide attempts that they each happened six months. And then we looked in the family. It wasn't until we discovered in her family history that her, I think it was her mom's twin brother got off a school bus and was hit by a car that pulled up in that lane beside the school bus. But it was six months after the family moved into their new home when she was little. You see how it happens? It, it's, it's almost as though we are primed to repeat these traumas unconsciously. Sorry, I think I cut you off, Susan. But, no, no, no. That's but I got inspired by, by this. You know, I get inspired to teach people these ideas that, you know, look out for, you know, it's yes, it's in, as you were saying, it's in your behavior, it's in your language, it's in your um, uh, uh, anxieties, it's in your fears, it's in your symptoms. Take, take, take these things apart. Don't just say, I have anxiety. Look at the anxiety. Don't just say, I have chronic fatigue. Ask questions. When did the chronic fatigue hit? What was happening right before? Things like that. Okay. Right. So an, another part that I found fascinating, and, and there were many, um, Again, I just I've got all my little tabs and markings in the <laughs> side of the book. You talked about uh, what you called the four unconscious themes mm-hmm. that somehow interrupt a person's flow of life. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about those and the importance of them and how they generate um, kind of the behaviors and the attitudes and beliefs that are created as, as a result of those. Mm, yeah, I'm happy to do that. I, I found that there are four ways that our life force unconsciously gets eclipsed uh, four ways in which our life force I mean there are other ways that are conscious but these are well you'll see when I start to explain four ways in which our success can be hampered or our relationships can be diminished or limited or our health or vitality I call these four unconscious themes um, well let me I'll just start them Number one, and I'll explain each one fully, we reject a parent, and then we have unconscious residue of rejecting that parent, that parent. And I'll explain that in a minute. The second one, we've merged with a parent. We've merged with the life experience. And I talked about this um, so far. Um, our father fails, we fail. Our mom loses her great love, we lose our great love. Our mom, we repeat, my mom breaks up with our dad at 30, and then at 30 we start to distance from our parents. So we've merged with this un- unconsciously, because we don't really know we do it. But our mom suffered, we suffer. Our dad struggled, we struggled. Thirdly, we have a break in the bond with our mother early, and the attachment is diminished in some way, and we have unconscious effects of this. And I'll I'll go through and I'll explain this. And fourthly, we are identified with someone in the family history, like that cutter, who was identified with grandma when she felt she deserved to die, and grandpa when she bled out. Um, But let me talk about the one that's most... um, hard for people to digest because many people reject a parent. We feel we didn't get enough from a parent. Our parent was critical, abusive. You know, we have our story, but we don't realize the effects of these rejections. When we reject a parent, we reject aspects of that parent's behavior that we find negative, but we reject it in ourselves. We can't see when we're the same. And then it expresses unconsciously in us. For example, if our mom is cold, we can't see when we are cold with a partner. Or we express that coldness the same way. In fact, we'll often project it onto the other partner as though that partner is cold. We can't see it because it becomes disowned in us. Instead, we're waiting for the partner to be cold or distant or critical 
In fact, we're hypervigilant, which makes people cold or distant or critical. We don't even see it because that's just our trauma brain, our limbic brain, keeping us safe. Our limbic brain, which is always in hyper-operation or hypo-operation, keeping us safe in some way by shutting us down or keeping us in fight, flight or fight. Um, this brain is making us hypervigilant by um, preparing us to say, oh no, don't let this happen to me again. So we're looking for the people we meet to be cold, distant, abusive, and we can't see where we are engendering, protracting the problem. Um, So these rejections, let me keep going. Not only when we reject our parent do we reject aspects of that behavior in ourselves and can't see it and can't see when we're the same or we're projecting it onto a partner or we're drawing a partner back toward us who has that behavior so we can heal it. Ultimately, it's to heal us. So we get a distant partner so we have another chance to heal it, but there's someone else we're distant with and we can't see it. We're distant with the small child inside us. We're distant with ourselves. If our parent was critical, we become inwardly critical. We know it. If our parent was aggressive, we become inwardly aggressive. If our parent was distant, we become distant with the child inside us. And we cannot do that. It is essential that we begin to heal our relationships with our parents, even though it's tough for many of us, and we have our reasons. But minimally, we have to begin to heal it at least inside ourselves so that we can stop our projections and our disconnections and our inner distance from ourselves. Well said, thank you. Yeah. So um, when individuals uh, do suffer trauma and they tend to repeat the trauma as a way of trying to heal the thing, um, could you show us a little bit, I mean, and you've talked about it already, but could you give us maybe another example of how this driver compulsion to repeat manifests in later generations? Right. Say, grand, great-grandparents or... Um, And does it always manifest in exactly the same way? Because I've heard some trauma, intergenerational trauma people say that it comes out differently in different generations, the behavior. Yeah, it really does. I mean, I could give a gazillion cases here. Let me let me mention a couple quick ones. Um, I once worked with a young woman who had irritable bowel syndrome, a pain in her um, uh, well, see, they didn't know what it was. That's what they labeled it. I, I always believe that diagnoses can block our inquiry with our condition um, and can shut down our relationship with the with the symptoms. Which we need to have a relationship with our symptoms so we can explore further. But they gave her this diagnosis, IBS. And in this diagnosis, um, we had to pick it apart. I said, tell me, are there fears in your IBS? Are there fears? And she said, oh, yeah, I have this debilitating fear of being kidnapped, raped, and murdered. Now, this is unusual. Uh, Did anything like this happen in your early childhood or to your mother or your father? Was anybody kidnapped? Did anything happen to you? Was there a a issue in the uh, in your um, attachment with your mom that felt like you were being hurt in some way because you stopped trusting your mom's love? No, nothing like that. She had no way to explain it until. We started following the trail of trauma, what I call the breadcrumb trail. Uh, She saw that her mother's little sister had a breast cancer and told nobody about it until her breasts were black and necrotic. And by the time people found out, she was dead. So I'm thinking to myself, what makes a woman not tell almost as though she's atoning for something. What makes a woman not tell anybody she has breast cancer, know she's dying, but not seek help? So I said to my patient, my client, 
the young woman with this fear of being kidnapped, raped, and murdered. I said, tell me about that grandfather behind your mother and aunt, the one who's that really nice guy, that janitor who works at your mom's school. And she said, oh, he, 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 was, he, didn't always, he wasn't always a janitor. He used to be a very powerful guy back in the old country. And I said, what old country? And she said, the Ukraine. And I said, when did he come here? And she said, 1946. And I said, 1946? What do you know about that? And she said, all I know is when the communists came back to power, they were going to put him to death and my grandmother to death. And I said, wait a minute, why? And she said, all I know is the Nazis helped him escape. I said, will you please go home and ask some questions? Well, she did. And she came back. And she found out that he was a Ukrainian National Socialist, a Nazi. And when the Nazis came to power, he took out his revenge on Jews, who he was angry at. And he kidnapped, raped, and murdered many young Jewish women. And somehow, this woman repeating pain in her womb and the feeling of the terror of being kidnapped, raped, and murdered, which she didn't have anymore once we did the work. So you see, it's very strange. We have the symptoms, but they may not be ours. Again, we're carrying the biological residues, as you were saying, uh, Craig and Suzanne, these biological residues, but they're not our traumas. Yes, we have the residues. They're living in our DNA, set off by epigenetic tags, expressing our genes in some way, but also embedding information about certain traumas in our, in, uh, through sperm, imprinted in the sperm of our dad, imprinted in the egg of our mom, and passed forward one of those eggs fertilized by that sperm, will become us. And we will have symptoms that, that, doesn't, that don't even belong to us. The stories that you speak of now and in the book are, are so powerful and examples. But I'd like to, a lot of the people that are listening are EFT and tapping and different kinds of practitioners. And so I'd like if we could segue a little bit into the process that you use for helping to elicit information, listening, and you speak about core language uh, mm-hmm. a lot in the book when you talk about trauma. Can you talk about this a bit, how you came to develop it, what it is, and how you would use that approach when you're speaking with and listening and working with somebody that's, that you suspect has had inherited family trauma? So I have to thank these patients that would come to me, or these clients that would come early with this unusual language that I learned how to heal. Here, um, my, see, my background is language. I, I, I basically find where language and trauma intersect. So I would hear clues in people's language because when a trauma happens, it leaves clues behind. And these clues in the, in the form of emotionally charged words and sentences, like I said earlier, they form a breadcrumb trail. And when we learn how to follow it, um, it, it leads us back to these traumatic events. It can also lead us back to our childhood and to our in utero experience, but it can also lead us further back to these biologically inherited traumas of our parents and grandparents. And when we know how to uncover this trauma language, these unconscious words, what I call core language, and link them to the original traumas, it's like finding the missing piece of the puzzle that lets the whole picture come into view, and then it gives us a context that explains why we feel the way we feel. In the book, I teach, I teach the reader how to become his or her own detective, to uncover these clues, and then I teach the reader how to link them to the traumas in the family history. I ask specific questions um, designed to pull out this unconscious language. For example, I'll ask people, um, what's their worst fear? That's one of my questions. What would happen to you 
If your life suddenly fell apart, Greg and Suzanne, don't answer. But it's a, you know, it's the question. <laughs> if, if things went to suddenly terribly wrong, and this is a feeling you've had all your life, even before you had kids, what would happen to you? What's that feeling you've had your whole life? If your worst fear, and when people answer that question, they give me another one of my tools called the core sentence, which is um, that answer to their fear. Um, I'll harm somebody. I'll, I'll go crazy. They'll lock me up. I'll lose everything. I'll lose a child. I one time worked with this woman. She was consumed with anxiety only after she became a new mother. She never had anxiety. She was fine. But once she became a new mother, she was consumed with anxiety. And when I asked her her core language, um, she said to me, I'll I'll harm a child. And I said, did anybody in your family ever harm a child? And she said, no. Oh, my, wait a minute. And she said, my grandmother, when she had a newborn baby, she lit a candle and caught the curtains on fire and the house caught on fire and she couldn't get that baby out of the house and we were never allowed to talk about and there you go it's again what i see people aren't allowed to talk about these traumas that's the driver compulsion to repeat these traumas how it manifests is that we're not allowed to do the healing the healing's incomplete in someone gets rejected someone gets excluded and then what happens is we repeat a similar circumstance. And we can't do the healing work. We can't do the neuroscience, which leads us to heal that part of the brain that's still drumming up and, and, and repeating aspects of the trauma. Thank you. Oh, powerful, powerful work. Thank you. Thank um, you. Mark, what about, yeah. I mean, given our world today with all the mass um, refugees and exodus from war and stuff and 9-11, the situations of mass trauma or natural disasters or even like the earthquake in Italy, what might be the effect on the children or grandchildren of the survivors or those who died? Mm. In your book, you speak powerfully about an eight-year-old Cambodian boy named Prak. Would you, could you share his story with us? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, w I would like that. Again, Suzanne, when we don't grieve fully, we find ourselves suffering similarly, developing symptoms that limit our life experience. As I said earlier, often when we reach the same age as a family member who suffered or maybe someone who died in that earthquake or a 9-11, which is why it's important that we grieve our loved ones who died. We do our inner work around it. We tell our kids about these traumas so that they can feel our ancestors as supporting them rather than haunting them. You know, there's a great line by Norman Deutsch in his book, The Brain That, Cha the Brain that Changes Itself. He says our ancestors can go from haunting us. Psychotherapy, he says, is about our ancestors can go from haunting us to literally being part of our history. Uh, I love that sentence. And, you know, you asked me about Prack. Here's a case where nobody would talk about what happened to the paternal uh, grandfather. So I'll, I'll tell the case. Prack, and that's not his real name, of course, is an eight-year-old Cambodian, Cambodian boy who bashes his head. He runs into walls. He has concussive head injuries. He runs into a basketball pole. He's done this seven times by, by rushing into a pole. And I ask the parents, what else does he do? That's a little odd that he seems to run head first into things. And they said, well, he also plays with a hanger. And what does he do with the hanger? Well, he slaps the couch and the floor saying, kill, kill, kill. So obviously, to me, because I do lots of this work, I know this is connected with uh, probably a head trauma. Somebody hit somebody in the head. Well, that's exactly what we found out. What we found out was the father's father was a survivor of the killing fields, but his father didn't survive. His father was accused of being a spy by the uh, Khmer Rouge, 
a spy for the CIA, which of course he wasn't. That was just an excuse they used. And they whacked him over the head and killed him. And here in the grandson was the the whacking, his arm coming down and whacking, saying, kill, kill, and the head injury, similar to our cutter, um, who was experiencing both aspects of the trauma in one event, one action of self-injury. I work a lot with self-injury, and in self-injury, often in that one action are two events or two experiences in that one action. So here, the worst part of it, what made this trauma stick, what made this trauma so salient, so potent, so uh, powerful in Prax's life, is that the mother never mentioned to her grandson that she had even had a grand, that his grandfather. In fact, she told him, I mean, sorry, the father. She, the grandfather told him that his real grandfather was another man. And that, that they, he never mentioned his own grandfather, his own father, to his son. Never. So I told him, go home and tell him about his grandfather, your father, and tell him how much you loved him, and tell him how much you were, were grief-struck when he died, the grandfather you've never told him about. And then light a candle and tell him that his grandfather protects him. In fact, put a picture of his of your father over his bed. They happen to have had a picture. And tell him that his grandfather protects his head at night. Um, you know, it's it's so amazing. Two weeks later, Brack hands the hanger to his mother. Says, Mommy, I don't have to play with this anymore. After they put that picture up over his bed. It just really illustrates what you were saying before, how this information is passed on without even the story or the telling of it, that it still has that impact generations down. It's it's just fascinating. And we need to do something. We, We need to find some way in which to heal these traumas, we need to um, find some way to engage the prefrontal cortex by pulling trauma energy um, away from the limbic brain, the trauma brain, the trauma cycle. And we need to practice the new feelings of this experience. What I had this family do by um, lighting a candle or putting a photo or having Prako inside to really feel the support and the comfort of his grandfather and the father even doing his work finding his gratitude and his love for his father or you know feeling the strength of his father behind him crack the boy the father feeling it feeling the peace inside and support these are all things that engage the prefrontal cortex all experiences that pull Trauma away from the amygdala, pull traction, I want to say, pull traction away from the trauma centers and bring it to the prefrontal cortex where it can be integrated. And then our, we can have these new experiences, these new sensations, these new feelings. And then our, I, I know you two work with tapping, which is another way to do it. And then our brains can change. In the book, I teach how to have these experiences and to create these new neural pathways so they can get laid down in the brain in a firm way so our brain structures can begin to wire together and we can heal. When we revisit these feelings and um, these new feelings and sensations associated with our new healing experiences, we we get a release of feel-good neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine feel-good hormones like oxytocin. Um, And the main thing, our genes, our very genes involved in our stress response, the trauma response, they can begin to function in a new and improved way. You actually broke right into, went right into my final question and started to go there as far as tips on how to break that trauma. 
I love how you use the, the genogram as far as a way of really viewing and, and collecting the information and doing it visually. And mm. then what I heard you say was there are any number of techniques, and, and whether it's tapping and whether it's imaginary conversations, whether it's holding an image of a picture, anything else that you'd like to just give us on tips of people that are working to, to break the cycle? Yes. When we, when we visualize our inner experience, uh, regions of our brain become to activate that are similar to having the real experience. Our brain doesn't know the difference when we're having an inner experience or an outer experience because the same neurons, the same parts of the brain become activated. Uh, tips. I, I like to tell people, huh, shake the family tree and see what falls out. What family secrets have been hidden? What stories didn't get told? What traumas have never healed? It's important to know these things, especially if we're unconsciously reliving elements of traumas that don't, that, that don't belong to us. If, I find that when we ignore the past, it comes back to haunt us. Mm -hmm. But when, when we explore it, we don't have to repeat it. We can break these destructive patterns. I, I also like to tell people to uh, talk about the traumas in your family, try to work through them. Um, this way, they don't get, they, they're less likely to be passed down to your children. And thirdly, lastly, do the healing practices that I lay out in my book. They work. They're the same ones I've been using for over 20 years, and they can be real life changers. So important. Thank you, Mark. Beautiful. Yes, Mark. I mean, I feel like we could talk to you for hours here. <laughs> <laughs> we probably but, could because there's a lot to say. But, but we really, we yeah. really, really appreciate your talking to us today, and I know that our listeners will be very inspired by your work. So once again, um, Mark Wallin, the author of It Didn't Start With You, How Inherited Family Trauma Shaped Who We Are, and How to End the Cycle, published by Viking in this year, 2016. If you, um, it's, a, it's a must read on your bookshelf. You should definitely have a copy of it. Mark, thank you so much. We really appreciate your being there for us. Thank you. Oh, thank and you, Suzanne. Thank you, Craig. To those of you who are listening to this call, don't go away. Craig and I are, are uh, about to um, share with you some um, parallels that we see for those of you who are matrix re-imprinting and uh, EFT and energy um, medicine uh, folks about how you can work with this book and this information. So um, just hang on here. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, thanks for continuing on to the tappingoutoftrauma.com post-interview discussion with myself, Craig Weiner, and Suzanne Fagel, and just a fabulous interview that we had with Mark Willen uh, regarding his book, It Didn't Start With You, How Inherited Family Trauma Shapes Who We Are and How to End the Cycle. And, you know, I think it's so obvious. Um, everything that he spoke about with regard to intergenerational um, family trauma are issues that we're dealing with. Uh, when we're dealing with EFT, tapping and working with people and their behaviors and beliefs and getting to the core and looking how to make changes in their life, how to resolve their past. The beauty that Mark spoke of is, is not just necessarily about things we've directly experienced in our life. It's following that trauma breadcrumb trail, as he spoke of, um, back to our own life and then back into our parents and grandparents to find what oftentimes is the unconscious source of so many of the traumatic triggers and experiences and problems that we're facing in our life. So love this interview. Hope you did too. And we're just going to uh, make it very applicable to what we're dealing with when we're working with EFT and matrix re-imprinting and all the different tapping modalities um, in energy psychology. So Suzanne, why don't you go ahead and, uh, and give it a start with some of the points that most... Um, that's you. Okay. Well, I mean, I think um, certainly some commonalities that we certainly have um, that we share with our clients that in terms of explaining things to them is, um, first of all, healing the illusion that somehow we are the source of the problem. Um, it's very clear from Mark's work that 
a lot of people when they fall into this intergenerational trauma think, oh my gosh, that whatever's happening to me is that I'm the problem and uh, as opposed to the, the trauma that's happening. And um, the sense that nobody is born with a clean hard drive, so to speak, that um, everyone comes in with stuff. And whether it's our early childhood stuff or it's ancestral trauma, um, we don't come in, you know, there used to be this thing that babies were sort of born pure and stuff, and we really now know that that's not true at all. We all come in with stuff either from in utero or past lives because there are markers on our genes that have picked up, as Mark talked about, uh, traumas from previous generations. Um, we also um, know um, that I think this is a really important part, that hidden or family secrets or hidden trauma, that um, often the, it can have a greater effect than traumas that are known in the family. When a trauma is made secret or <clears throat> kept secret and there's n nobody's ever talking about what happened, it makes it much harder for us to access why we're behaving or feeling the way we're feeling because we think we're just going crazy. And so there are just greater effects for not knowing what's behind how the trauma we're experiencing. And so there's a, a sort of um, need that we might pick up from Mark's work to shake the family tree, so to speak, with our clients and explain that, you know, first of all, trauma is biological, whether it's from this, our, this current life or from before, and that there is this emotional legacy that we carry around with us. And sometimes it's in very mild behaviors that we might do. And we say, oh, our, my mother did that or whatever. Or it takes on a more traumatic behavior when it's something that is harmful to ourselves and turns out to be related to a previous family uh, emotional legacy. So these are kind of sort of basic points that as we work with, um, with tapping modalities and energy, other energy modalities and looking at trauma that could be intergenerational, you know, these are some of the things we need to sort of pay attention to and think about as we're working with a client. But Craig, I want to, um, I would like, love for you to do, you know, we've talked, Everybody's talking about epigenetics, and epigenetics plays a role in inherited family trauma, but could you please just kind of do a review explanation about what is epigenetics anyway? Sure, and this is really such, such an amazingly um, exciting time for this field. I just you know, had the opportunity to interview um, Dawson Church on uh, his newest study. So there are now two um, epigenetic studies that are out there involving EFT, for example. Uh, the recent Maharaj study that showed a single session of 50 minutes of EFT actually altering the expression of 72 different um, genes. And so we keep hearing the phrase, what does it really mean? And so I wanted to give just a little background. So, um, so epigenetics, right, means above the gene. That's what epi means. And it's really the study of all biological mechanisms that switch genes on and off. So there are the switches. In other words, we have this blueprint of genes, but then we have these switches, the epigenetic switches, that either raise it or lower the volume, etc. So, you know, cells are the working units of our bodies, right? And the cells, all the instructions that are required to direct the activities of our cells are contained in our DNA molecules. So we have like over 20,000 genes um, made up of these DNA molecules that are instruction manuals in a sense of how to make proteins that become stress hormones, pro proteins that become, you know, all kinds of hormones and chemicals and proteins in our body um, that carry out our, our life functions. So epigenetics essentially affects how these genes are read by the cells and then how they produce these proteins and chemicals. So I think a good um, analogy would be this. I like this one. If you think of a human lifespan as a long movie, right, then the cells, let's just say, are the actors and actresses. They're an essential part of every movie, of course. The DNA would be the script. 
okay, the script or the instructions for what the actors say and how they perform and what they do on stage. The DNA sequence would be the words on the script and the paragraphs, and, and these um, directions basically instruct how the key events in the movie are to take place. Okay. Um, the genes are that. The ge genetics is kind of the genetics process is like the screenwriting process, right? So the concept then is that the epigenetic part of it would be the directing, the role of the director. So in other words, you can have two different directors, the genes. The script can be absolutely the same for both, but the director gets to choose to eliminate or to keep or to add certain scenes or dialogues altering the movie either for the better or the worse. So you can have two directors that begin with the same script, but ultimately they end up creating two very different movies by the time it's over. So when we start to look at epigenetically what affects how our genes express into the making of proteins in our body every moment, that is what you eat, what you think, what you feel, where you live, who you interact with when you sleep, um, your exercise, your aging process, all of these things eventually cause these chemical changes around the gene, or basically these layers around the gene that turn the genes on or off over time. And what's important with regard to the book is that epigenetic changes can be inherited and epigenetic changes are not only malleable, they're reversible. So what this is, is this is giving a science and an understanding how the things, the traumas that affect our life, the traumas that affect those before us, that have lived before us, alter the epigenetic regulation of what genes are expressed or not expressed. And this is a science that just underlies how what we think, feel, believe, experience affect how our genes get expressed and our health and well-being and, and, and our lives in such a powerful way. So there's a lot more, but, but at least that's a, a good beginning understanding, I hope. Um, yeah, thanks. That was really helpful. Okay. So let's also take what um, Mark was talking about with regard to um, the way that he was looking at ancestral uh, trauma and this trauma breadcrumb trail that we're following. And we want to look at how does this really um, reconcile with, with tapping, with EFT, with matrix ray imprinting. And it does in so many beautiful ways. Because as Suzanne was saying, often we think the source is me of this problem. That I have, you know, at a certain age, all of a sudden I started getting panic attacks and an EFT and MR, we're trying to figure out why. What was happening before this happened? What stresses were going on with our life? And sometimes that's very fruitful. And sometimes it's not. We don't really nail it because it didn't necessarily come from us. So when we start working, for example, matrix reimprinting is a great example when we go and visit an echo. Um, the energy consciousness hologram, which in matrix re-imprinting is that part of ourselves that dissociated and split off at a trauma, that 12-year-old that, that soiled their pants and it was traumatic and all of a sudden there's this echo or this hologram of this traumatized self still living in my field. And we go and visit and communicate and repair and go into that traumatic moment and be able to tap and work with and find the beliefs associated that were formed. This is very much like finding those separated parts of ourselves. But in Mark's work and in his book, he talks about going and visiting those past ancestors and doing healing that way. Well, that can absolutely be done in MR as well, and it is all the time. With regard to tapping, what we're doing is as we're bringing these memories, these traumatic memories into our prefrontal cortex, we're recalling the memory, we're tapping on it, we're shifting the way that we view that so that in the current moment we're no longer triggered, we're creating that memory reconsolidation process that truly rewires how we hold those past traumatic events, whether they're ones in our life or the ones that we, when we heard about a grandfather that caused harm to another person or a mother or a father that had lost a child or any of the traumatic events and they go on and on, both in EFT, MR and other modalities, we're going to these past experiences, bringing them up, rewiring them and transforming them so they no longer have to be a trigger for recurring behavior and traumas that uh, traumatic behaviors that we continue to repeat over and over. So 
I just think this book is absolutely a must for so many. It expands the consciousness, how we view just beyond our own history that we remember. Um, and it's just it's, um, a beautiful addition. I think it's great. Suzanne? Um, I, I just want to add to that, Craig, too, that one of the other things that he touched on briefly but talked about more um, in more with more emphasis in the book is that part of all this working through the trauma is also there's a big piece about forgiveness mm-hmm. and how important it is to forgive um, the ancestors um, and uh, the parents and the previous generations for whatever happened that unless we can move past being that we need to deal with the emotions we have around um, the the person that we interacted with with the trauma maybe but we need to also forgive and that that's a really important piece in the healing and w- that comes in very often with with a lot of our clients with both matrix re-imprinting and tapping so just sure. wanted to add that and then I'll add to that as well, just he does a beautiful job of just showing how incomplete healing relationships with our parents just show up in our personal relationships over and yeah. over, and how they show up in our limiting beliefs that affect our work and our success and, and, and just the things that we know. It just gives uh, um, an additional um, material to that. Right. So Mark, uh, in his book, um talks about the core language map, and he includes four things, the core complaint, the core descriptors, the core sentence, and the core trauma. And it, uh, with, that's exactly what we're looking for when we're doing um, tapping and stuff, is that we're looking for what is the person, what's the complaint the person's coming in with? What's the issue they want to deal with? What's going on? And how would they describe it? What are they talking about that they notice um, is happening, that they language? And then it comes down to a kind of a core sentence, which we might call a core belief um, in our world, but it's the same thing. It's like when you, when you narrow down, and he gives a whole way in which you can do it, but in our world, the way we would do it is by working with the tapping. And it basically comes down to a core belief that we've formed about life that has stopped us from doing whatever it is we want to do or, or keeps us stuck in, in a certain place. And from that core belief, then we can get, or core sentence, we can get to the core trauma, and especially an intergenerational trauma. So he gives the example, for instance, of the young mother who, as soon as she had a baby, was terrified around being with the baby and then the core sentence or belief that came up for her is I'm going to harm the child and then she came to realize that her grandmother had had that unfortunate incident with the candle and the baby burning and uh, so it was that core belief that got her back to going oh my god I forgot my grandmother had this thing happen to her with the fire so that's how, and that's often the way that we work. So to start listening for, through the complaints and the descriptors for, for, for a core belief that may be attached to the trauma is also a really important thing. As are, you know, the bridging questions. Mm-hmm. And the bridging questions are about um, uh, a a, a question that connects the persistent symptom or issue or fear to a core trauma or to a family member who struggled similarly. So it may be that, you know, you, it, uh, you're talking about something that a parent did to you and it's just like, I hate the way they do this and, and or I hate the way I do it in myself and there's this bridging question about, well, is there somebody else in your family that also did this or felt this way. And those bridging questions can also be very, um, those connecting questions can be very useful as well. Um, So we're always looking for language and questions that lead us deeper into the mystery and to get to the core of the thing. Similarly, we're also looking for behaviors or sensations or images or emotions or movements or gestures 
that we want to pay attention to. If somebody's always telling you they, they don't understand how they suddenly have all this anxiety or they keep doing a movement that suggests a particular image, um, like the boy, the little boy prac with the, with the coat hanger. He kept banging the coat hanger on the couch and saying something. So there was this repeated gesture. And sometimes it's an emotion and, and sometimes it's an image that keeps coming up. But in any case, this is another thing that we're always looking for. And especially if that feels really out of, how can I put this, way more intense and even the person, the client in front of you is baffled by, I don't understand why I should feel this way. My life's going really well. And so maybe it's one of those age-related intergenerational traumas where they turned a certain age. There's a bridging question. You know, how old are you? Did something happen? You know, did, you know, is there somebody in your family who had something significant happen to them at this time? So especially if the client themselves is feeling puzzled by the intensity of either the motion or the gesture or even the core belief, that's another sign that we might be looking for something that's intergenerational trauma. So mm -hmm. all these things are definitely contributors and um, really indebted to Mark for spelling this out. And I agree with Craig. This is a, one of those must-have books for sure. <laughs> okay. Well, we hope that you, as we did, absolutely loved Mark's interview and that our commentary was um, useful uh, food for thought. And we just want to let you know that tapping out of drama, <laughs> sounded like drama, tapping out of trauma.com is now open for our eight week webinar um, as of this moment. It begins on October 14th. It's an eight week webinar for tapping practitioners to really be able to take um, their training in working with trauma much deeper. Um, it includes everything from webinars and live calls and online Facebook group. And it's just, you know, the reviews from around the world are wonderful. Please look on the site. You can read them. Um, and we do hope that we will see you in the upcoming October 14th start for tappingoutoftrauma.com. We hope that you enjoyed our time today. We certainly did. Thanks for joining us. Yes, and thank you from, from me, Suzanne, and we really hope that you have enjoyed this call. So thanks, everybody, for listening. Bye for now.